want to talk today about the Gospel of Mark as a whole. This little gospel has been ignored for many, many centuries. Uh, it's been overshadowed by Matthew, by John, of course, even by Luke. Many people have considered it be, to be too short, uh, too abbreviated, uh, not clear enough in having enough teaching of Jesus. And so, actually until about 1970, until about 40 years ago, uh, this gospel was, uh, you might say, on the back burner. Since then, it has become quite the thing. Uh, the discovery of Mark, you might say, was begun by a group of uh, literary critics, people who read novels and such things as that. And when they got their hands on it, they were electrified. And they said, my lands, this, this gospel has an amazing story to it. It's a dramatic story. It's a story that you might call a mystery. It is an identity mystery. Begins in chapter 1, as we know, with the, with the baptism of Jesus. A voice from heaven comes and says, not this is my beloved son, as if to announce to the whole world who Jesus is, but to Jesus personally, alone. You are my beloved son. I am well pleased with you. Now, the writer of the gospel knows that Jesus is the beloved son. And now the readers know who Jesus is, the beloved son. Um, but the crowds do not know who Jesus is. They're not in on the secret yet. Another interesting a group of, of beings who are in on the secret and who know who Jesus is are the demons. And when Jesus encounters them, they try to identify him to the world. And Jesus uh, silences them and tells them, be quiet. We see this happening in even chapter 1, uh, where Jesus hushes the demons, the demon-possessed man, and will not allow this demon to identify Jesus as the Son of God. We move on to chapter 2 and Jesus forgives sins. We discover that there again, people are asking, who is this who can do such things? What kind of a man gives such teachings as these? And the mystery and the secret continues right on. Uh, we move on to chapters four and five, and you might remember in chapter four, the stilling of the storm. Jesus performs a miracle of unprecedented scope. And the question the disciples ask when they see the, uh, the fact that the storm has been stilled, the waters are quiet, the question they ask is, who is this who can uh, still such a storm as this? Who is this? So the questions just keep continuing. In chapter 6, we find that even Herod is in on the questioning game. Um, Herod has his speculations as to who Jesus really is. And he ponders, perhaps is Elijah, some say. Others say perhaps he's the prophet. But Herod had his own opinion. Herod thought, this has got to be John the Baptist come back from the dead. All the while, Jesus doing things, saying things, performing activities and performing miracles that no one could possibly imagine anyone normal doing. And the question is being raised uh, to a fever pitch now, who in the world is Jesus? We come to chapter 8, and in chapter 8, Jesus takes his disciples aside, takes them on a secret ret retreat, and he asks them, he asks, uh, who do people say I am? And Peter has his answers and lists those answers. Finally, Jesus buttonholes Peter and says, but, but uh, what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter has an answer. Peter says, you are the Christ. Um, and to an extent, that is a correct answer, but it's not the fullest and best answer. And we notice that Peter clearly reveals his, his ignorance because the very next thing Peter says is that he wants to reject Jesus' teaching that Jesus will, will die and be raised. He says, no, that's not for you. And so even though, Je even though Peter has something of a correct answer, it's not fully correct, and it hasn't yet dawned on the human world who Jesus truly is. Demons know him. Jesus knows himself. The Father knows him. The writer knows him. We readers know him. But the population, the human population, doesn't get it. Jesus continues. He teaches then in chapters 10, uh, in 11, 9, 10, and 11, that he's going to die. He's going to be raised after he has died. And he indeed enters into Jer Jerusalem. He is arrested, as we know. And in chapter 15, he stands trial before the Jewish authorities. And there they again ask the question, basically, who are you? And they put the question to him directly. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus' answer is, I am and you will see the Son of Man seated 
at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of glory. But of course, uh, these religious leaders do not accept that answer. And so in a sense, the secret still is not out. The human world still has not accepted the identity of Jesus until we get to chapter 15. And at chapter 15, we read the story of the death of Jesus. And there he is, he breathes his last. The curtain of the, of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. And we read this in chapter 15, verse 39. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that Jesus thus breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. This is the first time a full identity has been proclaimed for Jesus from the mouth of a human being. And in a sense, the story has been moving to this point along. Two questions. Why so late in the story? Why hold the secret so long? What's the point of holding a secret? I think a good analogy is to talk about a cake being baked. Um, you don't want to take the cake out of the oven before it's baked. And in a sense, Jesus' whole ministry, including his death, is going to be required. His crucifixion is required to be part of the story of his full identity. A title itself isn't enough. And so we need the whole story in order to see the whole identity of Jesus. But then, even deeper, what's the significance of calling Jesus Son of God? Why have a whole story devoted to getting to that punchline? What's so big about that? Many of us think that it's mainly a, you know, a, a matter of systematic theology, getting Jesus in the right category of being. He's divine, and that's fine so far as it goes. But we're missing a bigger code that this gospel doesn't actually make explicit, but would have been fully on the minds of people in Jesus' day. Son of God is a royal figure, a royal character. Son of God means he is the king of Israel. And what does that mean? King of Israel, as we learn from Psalm 72 and other Psalms, will rule the world. And the last step, this rule, rulership of the world, Jesus' kingship over the world by being king of Israel, as king of the world, Jesus will bring blessing to all nations. Reading Psalm 72, I think, is one of the best exercises in unpacking the full significance of Jesus as Son of God King, King of Israel, King of the world. As the ruler of the world, he will bring blessing, he will bring the defeat of evil, he will bring in the age of full prosperity and life as God intended it to be. Mm -hmm.